to you colleagues. My name is Faith Mkwananzi from the Higher Education and Human Development Research Group here at the University of the Free State. And on behalf of the group, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to our third webinar in the Rethinking and Reimagining Development in and Through Higher Education series. For those who have been joining us since the start of the series, thank you very much and a very warm welcome to this one. Today, we are deeply honored to welcome a prolific team of researchers. We have Prof Thierry Losha, who is the Research Director of Post-Schooling and Work at the Human Sciences Research Council in Cape Town. He is also an affiliated Associate Professor of Higher Education at the University of the Free State. We also have Dr. Giamohetze More. She is a lecturer in the Institute for Gender and Youth Studies at the University of Venda. Joining them is Dr. Angelina Wilson Fadigi. She is a senior lecturer at the Department of Educational Psychology at the University of Pretoria. Dr. Fadigi is also an extraordinary senior lecturer at the Northwest University. We have uh, Tsirele Tsolitswalo, who is currently in the process of completing her master's degree in research psychology at the University of Pretoria. Uh, finally, we have uh, Mr. Zepang Mahlati, who is currently a Master of Laws candidate at the University of the Free State. We do have their extended bios on the circulated invitation and if you had not already done so, I encourage you to have a look at the work that they are each doing in case you find similarities with the work that you are doing and maybe may want to reach out to any one of them outside this webinar. Prof Thierry does have a website that you can visit. It has a list of all his publications, most of which are open access. Today, the team will be speaking to us about the aftermath, which is a virtual walkabout through findings and photos of the student movement, violence and well-being project that they have been doing together. They will speak to us for about 45 to 50 minutes and the presentation will be followed by a response by our two discussants, Dr. Carmen Martinez Vargas and Dr. Ntimi Mutawa. I guess before um, we start the presentation, just a quick reminder of the house rules, please. Please keep mics on mute for the duration of the presentation. Feel free to post comments and questions in the chat box while the presenters are speaking. There will be a Q&A towards the end of the webinar and all questions will be posed then. It is at that point that I'll ask you to raise your hand and unmute your microphone. May I suggest that we limit the use of cameras during the presentation so that we keep the network connection strong. However, for those who can, may you kindly switch on your cameras during the Q&A session so that we have as close and in-person engagement as possible. So um, Thierry, Gia, Angelina, Tsireleto and Tsepang, it is an absolute honor to host you today and we're looking forward to your presentation. It is over to you now. Um, uh, thank you so much, um, Faith. I'm just switching quickly my camera on. I don't know whether I am visible. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am actually here at the University of the Free State and I'm here with uh, Zepan Mashatsi, who you can sit here uh, socially distanced behind me. Um, and who will um, shortly after me continue with the presentation. Um, Faith, uh, is it possible to see the presentation? Yes, um, I, we can see the presentation. Fantastic, then let us start and um, let me walk you through um, the work that uh, uh, we have been doing in the course of the last two and a half years. So, uh, as Faith has said, uh, today we are doing a virtual walkabout through findings and photos of the project called um, Violence and Wellbeing in the Context of the Student Movement. And um, uh, I am co-presenting uh, with 
uh, my colleagues, um, Chiamo Fezzi Morve with Cirelezzo, Lezzualo, Zepan Machazzi, and Angelina Wilson Fadigi. So, um, the way we are going to divide um, this uh, uh, um, presentation is that I'm going to start and just give a very brief introduction to the project and the objectives of the projects and its methodology. And then we're going to go right into the exhibition and we are just going to look at some of the exhibition themes. Uh, uh, we won't be able to cover all of the exhibition themes. What you can see on the side, the little video here is that there are actually multiple exhibitions that have come out of this project. The exhibition that we see here um, uh, running on the video um, is from the University of the Western Cape. Um, that is the work of the students there after um, three days of um, discussing and taking pictures and so on. Uh, and then uh, uh, writing those captions. We had a World Cafe event with um, colleagues from the university leadership and student affairs. And the, the exhibition that was specific to UWC was then put up on the wall and discussed with the colleagues from uh, uh, staff members, academics and student affairs staff members. Okay. Um, but just to say, so there are multiple themes uh, that emerged out of all the exhibitions uh, that were done on the different campuses. Um, Chiamo is going to present on protest and violence, um, Cirelezzo on safe spaces, and Angelina on well-being. And then Zepang is going to look specifically at some of the uh, photos uh, that came out of the UFS exhibition. Uh, because the UFS was part of the campuses that we visited and where we had photo voice workshops. We then going to close with just some closing remarks about the goals of the exhibition and hope to have ample time for responses and, uh, and questions. So um, as an overview of the project and the exhibition, so overall the exhibition that has been curated from about 100 pictures um, uh, that make up the five campus-based exhibition. There has been one exhibition that is cross-cutting and thematized, which is a collection of 34 images. Um, they are actually uh, online and the exhibition has been put online. It's uh, visible on South African history uh, online, um, which is, uh, of course, one of the most well-known and most visited uh, websites uh, in South Africa. Um, it's under the student movement uh, platform there. And the, basically those images re represent the experiences or rather the reflections on the experiences of violence and uh, the reflections on the search for well-being after such experience of student leaders. Um, the problem that actually gave rise to this project was that uh, I think even before 2015-16, but 2015-16 has shown how, what a problem violence on university campuses has become. And on, in parts, this may be violence that is from the students, students induced, but it, it can also be violence that was perpetrated by actually security personnel and police. And what we found is that there's more and more melt, mental health issues um, emerging uh, among students and staff. Um, and so what we wanted to understand with this research is the impact that experiences of violence has on student well-being. Um, we, for this purpose, we then uh, adopted the photo voice methodology, which is used quite widely in uh, public health research and uh, increasingly in educational research as well. And we adopted it in a way that we called rapid photo voice. Um, so the research team uh, centered around the HSRC, University of Venda and Pretoria has been working then with 35 students from five universities to um, have workshops and discuss 
their experiences and establish um, photo exhibitions that illustrate those. Um, we've shared um, the article that has been published um, on our methodology, uh, the methodology that we call Rapid Photo Voice. Um, uh, part of that methodology is that, um, uh, my apologies, whoever is not muted, can they please mute? <laughs> because I hear a lot of feedback from somebody who's eating. <laughs> Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so just in terms of the methodology, so um, we uh, uh, chose five university campuses. Uh, initially it was actually six, but uh, uh, we, we were able to do photo voice workshops on five university campuses uh, with five to 10 student participants each. The campuses or the institutions were UWC, Free State, Venda, Forte, and the Durban University of Technology. Um, Durban University of Technology, we had to adapt our um, methodology, and that was the only time where we took all of our rapid photo voice onto Zoom online, and we tried whether it is possible to do this in the context of COVID-19 online. So we would have institution specific three to four days of photo voice workshops. How that exactly played out is described in the paper. What was very important, of course, because it was important to establish quite quickly uh, a good rapport with the student leaders uh, so as to be able to share reflections on such difficult things like, uh, you know, once uh, experience of violence and well-being. So in terms of the demographics, the disciplines that are represented and the institutions, gender and so on, we were a very diverse team. And issues that came up are of course with regard to the ethics of such research, the trustworthiness of the findings and eventually as well the emancipatory and advocacy goals that an action research methodology like Rapid Photo Voice has. Um, so we'll talk a bit more about that at the end, but um, the uh, emancipatory advocacy goals, um, the, the current uh, uh, seminar is actually part of um, our uh, uh, joint uh, work of doing awareness uh, and advocacy work um, that started first on the campuses uh, during the, the, the one week visit when we did the photo voice workshops with the kind of World Cafe sessions that I talked about earlier. Then the online exhibition which is hosted by SAO. We also have uh, uh, the same exhibition as a traveling physical exhibition and it's only because of uh, COVID that um, it hasn't been traveling yet. It's meant to go to all the campuses where we've done workshops and beyond. Um, so far, we actually started with a non-case study campus. We were at Stellenbosch University uh, in April. It was beautiful, absolutely stunning exhibition. I think Aldo Brinkett, you here as well, has done a fantastic job uh, helping us uh, to get the exhibition there going. And then we've had advocacy meetings as well with colleagues from uh, University of South Africa, uh, also uh, during the Stellenbosch exhibition with student affairs staff there, and seminars like the one now, and we are doing many publications, a manual for student counselling professionals, uh, a, a scholarly photo book, um, which uh, is uh, kind of a, 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 the photo exhibition in book format as well, uh, that will be available articles and chapters. So um, just, uh, okay. So this is the last slide and then we're gonna go into the actual photos. So today we will be presenting from left to right um, on protest and violence as a theme on safe spaces. We're going to look at some of the photos from the UFS 
that form part of themes like trauma, oppressive spaces and escape. And then we are going to close on the theme of well-being. Um, and how what this actually means you will <laughs> see just now. Altogether, they are in addition to those themes, there's also the themes trauma, patriarchy, fear, escape, op oppressive spaces and unity, which we are not going to be able, except for with the UFS photos, we're not going to be able to go into detail um, here now. Um, good. Uh, may I hand over to Kiamo, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Terry, and thank you very much, colleagues, and everyone who made time to join us. Um, my theme is protest and violence, and we have uh, four photos that I'll take you through. May we, may we see the first photo, Terry? Thank you. Terry. Uh, this photo is titled Response by Asandi Bombana from the University of Western Cape. This high was. This picture was taken at UWC in 2015 during the Peace with Ball campaign. Songezo is holding up the cardboard with Bongo next to him. For me, the cardboard, the sign, shows the true narrative of how it was. We were responding to the violence. We were retaliating not the other way around. When you look at what um, is holding, it, the message is you kill us, we kill you. And literature has, all, has shown that uh, often students retaliate to police brutality and the protests do not actually start with violence. They start peacefully, However, because the university management is unwilling to, to negotiate or they negotiate in bad faith, then protest would escalate to violence because police would be called in. Thank you. May we have the second one? The second slide is called Mandla Tiban by Bob Sandile Masango of the University of Vendor. This is a photo of a late close friend and comrade of mine who was brutally attacked by police. After brutalizing treatment, he was badly injured. The police still detained him for no reason. He was about to register for a PhD, but because universities are anti-black, his life was shortened and he died having a pending case. I remember how we struggled to raise money to pay lawyers after the charges were fabricated, fabricated against us. This photo just shows how dangerous rubber bullets are and also how use, the use of rubber bullets goes against the principles of uh, the use of force and firearms uh, by, the, by the police, which is basically to minimize risk of injuries and protect the right to life. The third one is out of power, but not out of responsibility by Spetelo Shangem Tembo of the Deben University of Technology. This picture represents victimization, such as financial and academic exclusion that comes with being a student activist in an institution of higher learning. It also carries with it a lot of emotion because I can't read. It also carries with it a lot of emotion because we have to wait for whoever to pass. A lot of emo emotion because directing students and trying to assist them in a brutalizing system when I have also been a victim of the system was not easy. Despite my own challenges, I could not run away from my leadership responsibilities and I had to help lead the students in the right direction. This, this photo shows a, a, a side that we, we normally don't necessarily think of when it comes to student leadership, that students are thrust into roles that they are ill-prepared for 
because they get to encounter challenges that they cannot really deal with. I mean, he's saying he's a student and he has to deal with issues of, of exclusion. How does he deal with, with such when he himself is a student within the very system that, you know, also excludes him? But because he, because of his integrity and his love for being a student activist, he decided that I will rise to the challenge. Thank you, Terry. The last slide is the state of isolate by Siasang Andwai from the University of the Western Cape. In the picture, I'm in a police truck. I'm shouting through the window. We were arrested in parliament for protesting along or with pensioners who wanted money from the government, which they had been waiting for since the 1980s. In the truck, I was with three elders and a close comrade, Zwai Zaz. I've titled this image, The State of Izueletu, due to the fact that it depicts how we are treated in our land and the amount of violence we as young black people and our grandparents are subjected to. The irony of this picture is that there, there are two generations who are pitched in a truck and these two generations are basically fighting for the rights. However, the contradiction is that the elders want their pensions that were due to them for the apartheid era. Whereas now we have an activist in the democratic era who is fighting for his right to education. And from this we see that democracy in a way has not done what it ought to do. For, for 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 students especially and yeah that's that's the end of my presentation Tirelato will take over to speak about the safe spaces thank you hello everyone for those who have not seen me um my name is Tirelato Letswalo and i will be presenting on safe spaces The first picture is from University of Benda by Anyway Mikioni, and it's titled Mass Rescuer. The caption reads, the name of the photo is inspired by the experiences of student, students during a strike. This huge garbage bin is used by students as a place to hide during a strike. The resourcefulness of the comrades during a strike and the means they use just to hide from the police is amazing. This garbage bin houses the comrades and they do not retire from the strike despite the smells and the discomfort encountered in this big bin. Resilience is depicted in this photo as come what may, the students do not back down until their voices are heard. I think in this case, the caption speaks for itself. Can we please move on to the next picture? So the second picture is from the University of the Western Cape by Azania Simtandile and is titled Joyful Rebellion. In this picture, she's basically speaking about a place called Kilombo, which was um, a church in Kailicha that also acted as a political space for engagement among student activists. The caption reads, this picture was taken at Kilombo, a black space created for runaway slaves. We were slaves and imprisoned at the university. This space was our space of serenity and a space of love. This picture symbolizes the role of revolutionary song in movements and its impact. It is a reminder that the fight for free education was not new nor peculiar to South Africa. The picture was taken in Youth Month, during which we held deliberations around Steve Pico. Black consciousness and what it really means to be Black and youth. So essentially here, um, Kilombo allowed them to engage politically where if they were trying to um, hold debates and such on campus, they would be 
um, told to go away or maybe they were being ostracized in some manner or other. So in Quilombo, they were able to freely engage politically. The third picture is from the University of Venda again by Tepo Rasiala. It is titled, The Lost City Bolt Hole, A Hidden Haven. The picture depicts bushes found behind the lost city residences. This was where we disappeared into as students in times of conflict between students and the police. The bushes were used as a hiding place when the police advanced beyond the university gate. It is chosen because of its accessibility only to people on foot, making it impossible for the police truck to enter. The density of the bushes makes it easy for students to find refuge there. So like the first picture, this just so shows the students' resourcefulness in protecting themselves from the violence perpetrated by police and higher education institutions. The last picture in Safe Spaces is um, from the University of the Free State by Tepam Masati, and it's titled Counseling with the Hope to Locate and Cancel Pain make us feel again. The caption reads, to many people, this is a board that shows the location of the Student Counseling and Development Center at UFS. But what is not seen here is that this is an emotional archive area, a museum where all the unfiltered, raw emotions of the UFS community are kept and stored. Many ran to this place to make sense of their frustrations, pain, and anger. This place has become a home and an antidote for many who have hopes of canceling the pain of the violence of 2015 and 2016. This place has helped people like me to be integrated back into society after, after yeah, to be integrated back into society. After 2015 and 2016, I was never the same person. And every day we fight not to relapse. This photo highlights the very serious mental health impact from violence perpetrated by institutions and how it can dramatically change individuals' lives path especially for the worst. I will hand over to Tepam Masati to speak more on this and some of his other experiences during the student movement. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Um, I will be presenting on the UFS exhibition, Trauma, Oppressive Spaces and Escape. And because I was part of the team and I was part of the comrades, this will be coming from a point of a person who experienced the University of the Free State firsthand. But before I start my presentation or part of uh, the presentation, I want to make the following statement. In our writing, we will find collective healing. And in our writing too, we will write for words and wounds that we will never heal from. The first slide will be on oppressive spaces. This picture was taken trauma that will be from Bokang Fagun, and she, the title is A Violent Record. Now here, what, here lies the remains of what could have been a brilliant future. The impact of systematic uh, violence is psychological and long term. We are suffering from collective tra trauma as uh, black students in this institution. We are sharing spaces with the same people who violated us at Shimla Park and people who continue to violate us. We have to walk through the same corridors in which we, are, in which we were manhandled by the police. We are finding it very difficult to breathe because at any given time we might, be, we might get excluded, being it financially or academically, expelled or suspended. What Bukam tries to cover here, and, and of what I also feel uh, is what was happening to me personally, is that at the end of the day, we need to understand that now all the violence that was taking place did not only affect us physically as uh, student activists. Our academics becomes the record of that. And unfortunately, we are going to carry this scar for the longest of time. I was having a conversation with one of my colleagues and I said, every time I'm expected to answer the question as to why is your study record like this from 2016 and 2017? Unfortunately, I cannot account that without compromising myself, saying that now I was involved in the fees must fall. Of course, for employability purposes, many of the student leaders, I think, they still cannot account for this. And the fact that now this record remains like this, it becomes violent to them and for the longest of time. The question is, 
when will we ever be free from this trauma? Is it the lifelong, lifelong trauma that we're going to uh, experience? That maybe will be answered as we continue. The next slide, of course, is trauma. Now, this comes from me. Um, this is me there on the picture. And in this picture, on face value, we note that uh, a white lady trying to console a young black student leader uh, from a residence that was raided by the police. The picture also suggests that she is trying to understand the frustration and anger on his face. But what we cannot see from that picture is that she was the acting dean of students affairs. She knew that the police were going to raid House of Pedi. She was aware of the instruction that was given to the police to raid room to room at, and to look for perpetrators. And she also, uh, we can see the frustration and anger on his or my face. And you can hug me, which suggests that you can hug me, but you will never take away the feeling of betrayal and the pain inflicted on me, my people, my privacy. You knew it. Don't tell me how I should react or express my pain. He was never the same. I was never the same after this day. I was diagnosed with PTSD. I, I had to uh, 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 PTSD, signs of extreme anxiety, and I was on antidepressants. I had to put hold on my academics and had to pay back the buzzery because the buzzery had already paid for the year that I took break from. And also, then I should have graduated when this uh, 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 photo boys uh, process was taking place. But now I have uh, graduated uh, in 2021 this year, and I'm currently doing my master's of law. One thing about this picture or this whole, even a tight heart will never suppress or take the pain away. I still live with the scars. And the question that I always ask myself is that, what is it that you could have done differently? What is it that you could have done differently? What is it that the university could have done differently? And also, will we forever hide behind a corporate veil? Because I was the rector, I was the dean, I was the, the chairperson of the committee, I was heading the police uh, uh, at that time. I was only doing my job. But the question is, in all that process, what is it that you prepared? Or what was your contingency plan about the pain that student faced at the time, the scars and the trauma? We can have the next slide. On the next slide also, we have a picture by Comrade Kamhelo Mapike at the University of the Free State. It is titled, White Stand Violent Symbolism. He says, this picture is a symbol of sight of uninterrupted white hegemony, racism, and an extreme attitude of symbolic anti-blackness. The statue of Martina Stein is a reminder that racist African nationalism reigns supreme at this university. Moreover, it articulates that this space is, that this space was not meant for people of color, a violent articulation. By their very nature, statues are very are not only public artifacts. Beyond their shape, they scream violence. Of course, when you talk of, st of statues, one can say that now it is a symbol that unites and communicates the values of a particular group. But we need also to understand that now statues themselves are very exclusive. Statues themselves are they marginalize and they separate. And now also one thing that we also need to understand about the station and also the, the positioning of Martina Stein, it was at the center at the main building and it communicated every day or with each, with each and every student who didn't relate to Stein, it was saying to them, you don't belong here, you don't belong here, you don't belong. And of course we can have conversations and dialogues about how the statue cannot, it depends on how you interpret it. But at the end of the day, it remains the violent articulation. The statue was finally removed in 2020, and of course the university had to undergo numerous conversations where alumni threatens to leave the university. The question is, what is it that we can substitute what suggests to be white supremacy with? Were we supposed to keep staying there and exclude black students? That's the question that I believe, Prof. Terry, that when we research, we will be able to understand or rather identify or question the relevance of statues across South Africa. And now here we have trauma ring, which was a picture taken by Bokam Fako, who I'd also like to acknowledge she's part of the audience from the University of the Free State. She captions this picture of few comrades 
in doing it last of two. As a black, she says, as black people, we are not accustomed to inherently capitalistic and Eurocentric nature of coping mechanism, such as therapy. Such as therapy. We are, we cannot, afford, we are not inclined towards the easily, uh, we are inclined towards easily accessible and uh, what is easily accessible and afford, affordable, which tends to be alcohol and drugs. Black students found, found solace and relatability with each other through their pain, struggle and collective trauma. We forgot what it means to be alive. We are constantly surviving. And now when you look at this picture and you look at where it is, uh, 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 under which theme it is uh, uh, put under, we can look at escape. We say that now we are trying to escape. But the question is, who are we escaping from? What are we escaping from? Why are we trying to escape? And how are we doing it? And unfortunately, as black students and comrades, this was the only way to engage on ideas, to share our pain, and also to try to console each other as we navigate through pain, and oppressive spaces that traumatize us. Thank you. Okay, Angelina. Yeah, um, good afternoon everyone again and thanks for the time. I will take you to the end of our presentation with the themes on well-being, which was quite difficult to tease out when talking about an issue of violence. Um, Terry, let's go to our first slide. Okay, so one of the themes on well-being that oh yeah yeah themes on well-being that emerged or pictures that we believe did depict some form of well-being and and when we think about well-being here yeah, we're thinking about it holistically in terms of psychological coping in terms of resources in terms of um, you know indicators of some form of functioning amidst the things that are going on and so we see this picture here from Kamohelo Mafike at the University of Free State and it's titled The Black Who Books of Consciousness and very specific to this is how some of these books reinforce the pride and dignity of black students um, and, and, and it allows them to constantly see beyond or, or to be able to grow beyond and experience life beyond the kinds of brutality and police violence that they are faced with in terms of when 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 there's disagreement at campus between management and students and if you look at the the, the description here also um the, the the student talks about how these books give light to their understanding and one of the things that is key to well-being is a sense of meaning making being able to create um, meaning out of chaos being able to create meaning out of life despite what is going around um, and I, I believe that one of the reasons we did include this particular picture and the well-being is that meaning making function um, allowing them to see themselves beyond the violence allowing them to feel a sense of pride and dignity and allowing them to see that no this is not um, what we deserve but this is what the systems tends to perpetuate and so that sense of meaning making was quite critical using um, some of these um, noteworthy literature um, books like um, um, by, by Steve Biko. Thierry, let's, let's move. Okay, this picture, I will not read the, I'm not, so easy, I'm not sure if it's Tosa or, or I'm not sure the language, I'm not going to try to read it. Um, I'll read the English version, um, The Beauty of a Man, and this was by Sipilelo um, in Tembo, and very interesting, um, we had the the photo voice sessions with the with DUT online, and so it was a it was a very interesting process to go through. And what was being depicted here by Sipilelo was the ability or the space um, to be able to take his mind every, off every other thing. So he did describe that after he was suspended, um, he had the chance or he had to go back home. Um, deal with the cuts and this was something he did when he was very young but even though it was supposed to be a negative space he was suspended you know his academic future was uncertain um 
he called this this particular space a very useful distraction that was refreshing. And we, we do see in well-being studies that at times people need to find a space where they can reconnect with their inner selves, where they can find a sense of kind of a, a sense of rejuvenation. It doesn't mean that the problem out there is actually solved. So the issue is not solved, but being able to find such a space was quite instrumental for um, Sipelelo's well-being, the beauty of a man. Let's see our next picture. Structured violence, a safe space. This relates very closely with a picture before this, um, which is from, which is by Madoda Udidi um, in the University of the Free Space. And he talks about, let me read it because I really like the, the narrative. Rugby is a game of structured violence. So he's kind of um, comparing the violence on campus with what he experiences as a rugby coach. Um, and he says that, what happens on the field is one of structured violence. It is my safe space from the context of structural and institutional violence, which for him had no control, had no, um, there were no rules to it. Whereas on the rugby fields, there were rules and that made it manageable. And for him, that became a safe space because he understood that space. Um, it took him away from other uncontrollable situations. On the field, there are rules that clearly structure the exertion of violence here as a here as a rugby coach I am in control of the violence on the field after encountering um, protest violence the the rugby field becomes a therapeutic space for me so we see that importance of a space being repeated um, from the previous picture and also here let's see okay divine communion and this is an anonymous picture from the University of of, of, of free state and although the, the title says Divine Communion, you if you look at the description, it kind of brings you back to the theme of space, um, of a person, of, of a safe space, of a space where people can um, experience that inner peace, inner harmony, inner requiem, and 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 feel rejuvenated beyond what is going on around them. And so this particular student described that this image is one of my personal space with my books positioned ab above me. So she, she talks about the books and talks about the space. This reminds me that I need to constantly reach above me in order to make sense of the injustice I see and experience. I need to educate myself, surround myself with the work of scholars and thinkers and empaths so that I can process my experience. So she does two things here. One, um, is having that space in the first place. And then secondly, the meaning making process that we see happening um, on the picture that depicts black consciousness. And, and so for us, it, it would seem that for people to be able to function or to be able for us to, be able to identify resources for functioning, it's about being able to create meaning, being able to find a space where that, that inner peace or inner harmony can be experienced even though the outer conditions of the real problem is yet to be fully addressed. Not that that shouldn't be, but it gives them a space not to get to um, a point of breakdown. Okay, so our last slide now, it's, it's, it's kind of a reflection and I'm just gonna go through some of these things. Um, and when we started off with this project and also with the exhibition, we had certain questions in our in, in our in our minds and whether these have been or these goals have been adequately achieved is another thing but one of the things we wanted to do was to be able to expose the unacceptable high levels of violence on university campuses and we acknowledge other studies have done it but the fact that it's reoccurring and the impacts that we see means that this is this is a conversation that we cannot stop having um, you can't stop having the conversation when the same thing keeps occurring. It means that whatever interventions have been put in place are not just working. Another goal was to create awareness in the public. And so we, it includes government, includes higher education policy makers, university leaders to ensure that student grievances are taken seriously. So um, when Kiama was um, presented, she mentioned how protest is never the first step 
or violence is never the first step, it's always a response. And so in our study and, and also reoccur what we've seen in other works that if that is not the first point of call, then we need to address the real trigger and not just address and, and not just thinking the problem is the violence. It means that there is an underlying problem that needs to be addressed. Um, another goal is, is that is, is a suggestion, as a recommendation on, on, on police riots and security services um, on campus is using very forceful um, um, response Techniques, we had a very interesting experience, um, if I'm to mention it in a minute, at the University of the Free, sorry, um, um, not Free States, University of Fort Hare. Um, whilst we were on campus, we saw these armed men, and if you see the gadgets they were holding, you wonder if it was a war scene or it was a university campus. Um, so when we were like, no, um, this speaks a lot to the kinds of reactions you would get from students because then it, it, it incites fear and agitation. And when fear starts and all sorts of reactions follow, um, destigmatize student mental health issues. Definitely, um, we saw from, from one of our, our pictures, the escape shouldn't be the way out um, um, because those are not very useful coping strategies. Um, people should be able to see mental health services as something that is accessible and useful for them um, and, and well-being should be at the center of it and not just cure and, and prevention, but the, the promotion of well-being should be at the center of student mental health services. Then um, people will not feel stigmatized if they need to use such services. And, and, and also, and so that speaks to the last point that we need to expand um, um, student counseling services. Thank you very much um, for your attention. We welcome questions, comments, and we hope to continue this discussion. Thank you. All right, all right. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, I guess now we would have to give time to our respondents. I will start with uh, Carmen, please. Hi. Um, I hope you can hear me. Everything is good. Video. Perfect. Yes. Just a second. Well, um, thank you um, to the team for this powerful, detailed and moving presentation. I really would like to congratulate all of them on this excellent project. It brings a lot of thought food for thought and um, a lot of reflection about um, how to look for the way forward of moving after all this um, injustice is suffer and the um, response to it through protest and what we do with these events when when they happened. Um, I would like to start talking about um, the application of the participatory research and later on I will move um, um, towards some aspects um, and dimensions within the research. So um, I would like to say that certainly applying uh, participatory research is not only a question of moving from a step one to a step two, uh, but rather a constant process of reflection, questioning and analysis of or positionalities as researchers, and the research in itself as a political entity carrying and sustaining power asymmetries. And all this is clear throughout the project from general aspects such as ethical considerations, but equally on those related to the composition of the team, which I found quite important. In this area, I believe the research team overcame barriers not only bringing together partners from different institutions around the country, but from dif different disciplines, departments and levels, which I found substantial for the articulation of different knowledges and the representation not only of participants' knowledges, but also those carried by the team members. Equally, I found the focus of this research enlightening. When we think about a student protest, we will probably focus on the inequalities and injustice these protests are against or the collective articulation of this mobilization. But little is said about the consequences of these events on the individuals who do not have 
any other option than to take part on protests as a defense of their more substantial human capabilities. For instance, as we have seen throughout the presentation, educational epistemic capabilities, but also the defense of their more fundamental dignity as human beings. Hence, violence in this research is important, not only at the experience level, but as the response level and the impact on individuals' lives and well-being. As it was said, violence is a response, not the first step. It recognizes violence before and violence after protest, bringing a wider perspective of what is commonly seen at first sight resistant to oppression, not the aftermath of physical, psychological and emotional oppression against collective resistance and its individual effect. On the other hand, and focusing now on methodological aspects again, I believe the team did a remarkable job not only engaging critically and deeply with the participatory literature, but also doing so its practice as presented in the paper that it was shared before this uh, presentation. Especially relevant here is this paper um, and how they present um, the rapid photo voice in a highly complex landscape of practices and more times than not misunderstood field of participatory research. I believe one of the major strengths is the importance given to connect student experiences with management and university workers as a direct and clear channel of meaning making and understanding. This is, as it was said during the presentation, the importance of safe spaces for true conversations. Um, this is especially important for me and perhaps for many others because we have met many students who were part of this protest and felt unheard and ignored by their institution. For instance, in the case of the University of the Free State, the seamless incident. Thus, we know that the written and oral reports generated by the institutions were not enough. Again, as said uh, throughout the photos, they said that we need more than a hack to, to heal, as said today. So it's not just about hacking and reporting, but something more. So thus, transgressing uh, the bureaucratic and institutional procedural line of universities, as the team has done, bringing emotions and a student's lives and well-being, including the ill-being, to the center of this conversation, is a real example of how we can advance toward more engaging, reflexive, and power-sensitive research that actually that makes uh, a different in our in our lives. To conclude, I would like to perhaps reflect and comment on two aspects after this presentation and reading your paper, which might, of course, go beyond the scope of this study, but perhaps can be significant for the discussion today. These are, can we understand violence during protest before and after? as a compendium violence in plural rather than singular that go beyond the individual. How can we acknowledge and recognize both the violence before and after individual and collective without dismissing any of them? I think we have seen partly this, but I guess I wonder how we can do this without dismissing any of them, how we can pay attention to the individual and the collective and how we can acknowledge the different violences that are behind, as it was mentioned um, through these protests that are another event of violence or the visible event of violence. And finally, even if we know the adaptation of the participatory methodology is fundamental in this type of process, as mentioned in your paper, are we condemned to adjust or methodological operationalizations only because of time and funding constraints to ensure efficiency? 
where do we draw the line between working with dignified individuals and attending aligning with institutional logics that might go against the individual, this individual's well-being? So thank you so much for, um, thank you so much to all the team and congratulations for this excellent project. Thank you very much, Carmen. I, I, I do concur. Congratulations for this excellent project. Uh, I'll now ask uh, Timmy to please um, comment on the presentation. Chair, um, I'll, um, could you excuse me now to put a video? My bandwidth is very weak this side. Um, in fact, I've been struggling to uh, hear. But I hope I'll be I'll be I'll be um, audible enough. Um, can you hear me? Um, you are audible, Timmy. We can hear you. I will mean I'll switch off my Thank video in, in case that helps. Thank you so much, um, colleagues. Terry and um, and Cole. I must um, start by saying um, I'm not even a photo voice methodology person, but I think I'm, 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 I'm slowly being tempted to to utilize some way um, at some point in my, 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 my research. The way you framed it, um, but also the utilization of it, um, um, they're really very impressive. And I'll start from the, uh, from the methodological point of view, which for me is compelling and um, for me, it was fascinating to see, you know, um, how much photo voice as a methodology can reveal so much uh, in terms of, you know, bring so much uh, diverse voice, and but also that bring that element of inclusivity uh, in terms of different kind of voice. Um, but the meaning behind those photos, and and you guys have done a very good job in trying to make sense of. You know what this photo is all about and the meaning behind it. But again, for me, another important element which was um, interesting to me as an individual was the the kind of reflection that has gone into it, and um, you know, and being able to articulate it. Um, that for me is something that I've, I've taken, but also something that is a lesson to um, people who really want to venture into this kind of methodology. Then I'll go to the, the, the cracks of the uh, talk itself. When you guys started talking, as when Terry started and giving a background and um, you know uh, where, you, where the old idea came from, the project itself, I started to think about Franz Fanon. I'm, I haven't read so much, much of his work, but I've, um, here and there I've read. Um, and the biggest question I, I, I start to ask myself was, you know, drawing from Fanoni's um, point of view, um, was um, the issue of, you know, the necessary. Hello, uh, Timmy. Um, can anyone hear me? Am I the one who's having a network challenge? Can you hear me? Okay, okay. Please can go ahead, me? Timmy. Yes, yes we yes. can hear you now. So, so, so I was saying, when Timmy started talking, I began to think about the Franz Fanon's work on the wretched of the earth, where he speak about uh, the necessity of violence, and. Uh, um, then he asked, can you make a very good um, argument to say, you know, without violence or protest, you know, we can't, we cannot be able to remove oppressive regime. You know, they'll always be there. So, so from the, the photo itself, for me, I could begin to think and reflect how much these students really um, use those spaces to try to send a message you know, to this oppressive structure, systemic structure, um, the structure of power. And then, <clears throat> but at, at what cost? You know, that's a question I ask myself, at what cost? And then the issues of agents come into play, you know, um, you know, so, 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 
I've been able to really ask more questions um, in terms of like to what extent is this kind of protest or I don't know whether protest or violence are the same thing or is a different kind of um, the same meaning behind the violence protest maybe you guys will be able to, be able to respond to me about that you know to what extent is this kind of protest really help us to reach or to move towards Frank Fanoni's comment on you know um, being able to remove those structures of power and oppressive structures, which are for me are the result of these continuous, repeatedly uh, uh, student movements or protests. Um, my thoughts are very, they are all over because I'm trying to really make sense of of the, the entire uh, talk um, in many ways. But for me, the evidence behind the whole um, exercise of using these photos to Generate evidence um, was to, to to see how much the, the complexity behind this kind of protest, but also some of the things that are taken for granted in terms of how much um, pain and you know, um, trauma and victimization it brings to students, and we often don't talk about those kind of things. But again, from this kind of uh, study, we begin to see this kind of um, evidence being revealed. But I will go back to my question, how much this kind of protest can really help us to reflect on the broader issue of systemic inequalities and enduring inequalities in, um, in a society like South Africa? Because they often happen. Last year we had it, is it last year or this year. And I'm sure we're going to have another one. And I'm sure we're going to have victims, children being victimized because of those kind of uh, protests. But how much then can we begin to use this kind of lesson to um, begin to change, maybe in the smallest way, but to begin to really touch those structures? And can this protest be one way of doing that? And I think those photo voices, really, the voice behind those photos give us so much to think about. Um, <clears throat> Just, I, I'm beginning to find difficulties to really put my thoughts. Uh, you know, when I was listening, it may be something to 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 for, for question for discussion. Um, is uh, is this uh, one is more of methodological question, but I kind of give goes to as far as to evidence issues. It's a question of, you know, um, those photos. When I was looking at it, the kind of voice that is given there does it really give us the reality, you know, of the kind of um, conditions under which students really operate in South African higher education context. That's really is that a reality really? How much can a photo really tell us? For me, that that's a question I really want to know. How much can a photo tell us? Because sometimes we make we may make a lot of interpretation behind the photo, but it's clearly a reality on the ground. For me, that, that would be my concluding question. And I hope you guys will be able to, to provide some of those, some of the response to my question. Can I see a photo and make a little sense of this photo? Is it a reality, really? Sometimes you look at houses and say, oh, this house is for a poor person. But is it true? You know? So I don't know. But thank you so much for this provoking um, uh, talk. and. Uh, Really, I'm looking forward to more discussion about this, and but also to see how far this methodology can go to help us begin to use it as a, one of the key of um, a framing of uh, different kind of research in our higher education space. Thank you so much. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you very much to our two discussants, uh, Carmen and Timmy. I think they do raise very important questions that are food for thought uh, for everybody who's using photo voice or who's doing similar kinds of work with students. I guess now I will open the floor to, to the presenters to respond to, um, to the questions raised by the two discussants. Should I start with you, uh, Thierry? Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Faith. Um, wow, thank you so much, uh, Carmen and uh, Ntimi, for your responses. Actually, they are 
quite overwhelming and very much spot on uh, in my sense have you also given me new ideas to think about this project you know um, uh, and I, I love the point where Carmen and Timi's comments actually converge um, the point around the violence uh, or rather violences um, uh, and Carmen put it so well you know it talks, this uh, uh, exhibition talks about violence before and after and not only during, because usually we only talk about violence during protests. We focus on the student violence, on, you know, bur uh, buildings being burned down and th stones being th thrown and so on. Or we talk about police brutality and privacy being invaded and rubber bullets being shot. But it goes beyond that because the students' discourse also includes violence before, saying we are responding to a violent system. We are responding to a condition that is violence, to something that is systematic and systemic. Um, uh, and oftentimes even that is not only before, even during protesting, it is it is not necessarily always the students who throw the first stone. And then, of course, what happens afterwards and the attempt um, at meaning making. I, I really liked the distinctions that Carmen started to talk about between individual and collective violence, between uh, structural violence and and so on and i just thought about there's a kind of also a progressive violence an emancipatory type of violence and then there is the kind of the reactionary and conservative violence that the state and the university would exert um, in order to try and uh, get uh, assert its own uh, authority and i think uh, in, in that is where um Timi's comments come in so well um which is the question that he raised is, have the students actually succeeded in what they perceive to be oppressive structures of power? And the understanding that um, within, within the structures of a higher education institution, it is extremely hierarchical. And we sometimes forget that the staff structures are hierarchical, but at the bottom of the rank of the staff structure is the student. And also, of course, I mean, some of your colleagues have been doing research into the casualization of academic staff, right? That as well, of course, is, is, is you know, within the staff structure. And the question is whether these structures, which are structures of domination, which are structures of authority and subjugation, which are structures which will um, provoke some kind of a resistance, various kinds of strategies of resistance. In some cases, they are just to want to be out, just to want to be out of that, just to want to move. Up. In some cases, it might be assimilation. And in other cases, it might be um, that there are modalities of resistance, like what, for example, um, James R. Scott was talking about, you know, hidden transcripts, um, which then occasionally spill out into the open. Um, uh, so thank you so very much. Um, uh, the last thing I wanted to say is, of course, that um, what both of the respondents actually alluded to, and I've only come to think about that now, is that what makes this exhibition somewhat strange to listen to is that it shows a student discourse and it shows that this discourse is different. It's different from the dominant discourse, you know, it's different from what we hear in the newspapers and so on. And with that, of course, it, 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 it hopefully can serve that uh, advocacy and awareness raising uh, purpose. OK, I see Melanie has her hand up and maybe others want to respond to. Thank you very, very much. This was so, so helpful. Um, thank you, uh, Thierry. I think before I give Melanie a chance, there is a comment from um, Anita Venter. 
and she's uh, she's asked rather that uh, have the students who took part uh, took the photos or statements being used uh, are they present during this webinar and if they are it would be very great to also hear their reflections on their personal stories so uh, maybe uh, while i give melanie a chance to ask the question uh, the students may be thinking about what they would want to reflect on okay okay thank you uh, melanie please go ahead um, thanks very much, Faith, and thanks very much to Thierry and the research team for, for such, um, such an interesting presentation and, and such a fascinating uh, project. And, and to see how, how you've worked with Photo Voice, because we've, we've done quite a lot of Photo Voice as well. I want to um, ask something about the well-being aspect of the, the title of the presentation. So, and I think it was Angelina who did speak quite a bit about well-being, and of course it was a thread which was pulled through the whole presentation as well with the, um, you know, the really compelling photographs and the, the descriptive text and reflective text uh, generated by, by the photographers. But I'm, I'm going to borrow uh, Carmen's conceptualization um, of violence and, and turn it to well-being. Could I ask, um, anybody on the team to comment on how how well-being was conceptualized in this project both before you started the project if and how it shifted during the project and if and how it shifted again after the project and in this process of thinking about well-being uh, what what surprised you so yeah thanks very much um, thanks melanie for that question. Um, so we did conceptualize well-being from uh, well, what we or what I work on, which is positive psychology, thinking about indicators of function or what makes people well, what are the resources um, that people capitalize on to live well. So kind of moving away from the preventative and, 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 and medical model where we wait for people to fall off um, the clip before we save them, so more of a health promotion perspective. But so yeah, let me just put it that way. That's where we started from. And how did it change during the project? We noticed right from the first campus visit that it was almost impossible to ask a question about well-being. Students were like, no, don't ask me how I'm doing. Um, I, I don't think that is the right question you should be asking. I, I can remember UWC vividly. So um, it was quite difficult to ask about what, what, what makes you well, what made you well, or what are some of the things, resources that you capitalized on going through this process. And why was it difficult? Because it wasn't over. Um, if you think about violence before, violence during and after, it wasn't over, it was an ongoing process. It was difficult to, to ask the question in the past tense or in the present tense because it was an ongoing process. Um, how did it change or how are we thinking about it now? If you look at um, some of the sample pictures we provided, and I would say we're actually struggling to publish our paper on well-being right now because it's not well-being enough. It's not positive psychology enough, but it's also not um, when you get into the violence literature or journals that want to deal with that, it's not violent enough. It's that middle ground and rethinking what we what we call being well or what we call an indication of functioning. So it, it's it's the change. I think it's no it's not so much as to where we are right now, but as to how we are embracing the change in in the explanations and 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 some of the indicators that we're giving. Because I'm sure somebody would say, no, but these pictures they don't say much about being well. If I if I'm to think about well being in the traditional positive psychology sense, um, it doesn't say that. So it's more of us embracing this change and being able to articulate it very well, um, and getting other people to see that um, you can't we can't stay with what we know we, we need to think beyond it because if somebody says my personal space and having books that um, help me to think and be able to analyze what i'm going through is what makes me one that's what makes me get through this 
this difficult time or how to uh, that makes me that helps me to deal with violence on campus and that's what it is it might not fit into our our theories and and, and very neatly categorized aspects of well-being maybe Thierry will want to say something because we had this discussion last week about our study not being you know well suited to well-being enough and and also not you know, just that shift in space. So, Melanie, thanks for the question. I would like to hear what your responses are. If Thierry wants to say something. Uh, no, maybe Kiamo, but I'm okay. I think you've covered what I would know to say about this topic. Okay, I see, uh, Melanie, uh, did you raise your hand for the second time? Uh, yes, if I, if I can just respond very quickly. Um, you know, I just wonder if the, the team might not want to go to the capabilities literature and to see how well-being is conceptualized in that literature, because it seems that um, if, if you look at those photographs, they do tell you things about well-being. They tell you things like having a political voice um, and having that political voice listened to is an aspect or is, is a, a key functioning for having well-being. Um, they tell you that having um, emotional balance or emotional harmony in one's life is a key, uh, a key aspect of well-being. And of course, in the capabilities literature, well-being is made up of um, a set of valued capabilities and the associated functions. So it's really just a comment um, and, and that might also help you then in pulling together these ideas and, and thinking about getting them, them published. Thanks very much. That, it, it's really a comment. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. We'll take that down. I will we'll look at that. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie, for that. And thank you, team, for responding to that question. I'm wondering if we do have uh, any of the students uh, who would like to reflect on the stories as Anita suggested. Yes, yes, yes. Um, just to reintroduce myself once again, my name is Tepa Matlazi. And when I see the comment uh, from Anita, there's quite a lot of things that one can reflect on. One, I was having a conversation with Prof Terry yesterday and I said, this webinar for me is the meeting of the triggers. And when I say it's the meeting of the triggers is that I need to sit and look at all these pictures and also narrate the stories that uh, Anita, I cannot account for. Um, when I'm listening at uh, the discussant, uh, discussants now, one of the things that was mentioned of was before, during and after violence, that process. And in most cases, we as the students would like to say, we know exactly the in, uh, uh, before. And when Prof. Terry uh, comments on that, says that now there's so much that is happening, uh, the systematic violence uh, we, and the stations, the spaces that are not communicating or talking to us. And when this whole discourse on the, the fees must fall, stay must fall, um, uh, who's this? Um, from, uh, from Cape Town, all these stages where we are saying that now they must fall. We are saying that now the environment is not welcoming to us. The environment is not speaking to us. The environment is excluding us. The language that is being used, the treatment that we receive, the uh, uh, insufficient uh, wellness services that are at the universities are not enough. And now when this whole fees must fall movement or uh, 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 rules must fall movements took fire, I would say catch fire, there were so many other things that we wanted to speak on. Already we could pick up that now. Yes, there was an issue about one, two, three that was happening and we needed attention to that. Um, Anita, I was one of the students on, on the 25th of, uh, of February 2016 when the police came to House Soropili and they raided House Soropili. I was the prime of the resident and when that happens, uh, according to the, to, to the Shimla Park report that was made by Justice Van Vestes, and it was identified that now the university knew of the police that were going to come to our school. Really. The Dean of Students Affairs was aware of that, everything that was happening. And now when you sit and reflect that now I'm elected to lead these students and the university, they trust the, the, the bureaucracy or rather the, the student leadership structure. But when it comes to the decision making that involves violence, we are not considered. One thing that I picked up was that, yes, 
as what I've identified and I love about being part of the, when I was part of the photo voice group and, and the study was that I also, as a student leader, I identified my role in this process. Uh, uh, there were instances, whether with decision making, whether in, uh, through action or in action or mission, there were instances where I say, I might have perpetrated to this, but the question still remains, Anita, did this uh, warrant the reaction of the universities? Did this warrant the, uh, the, the way in which universities reacted, rubber bullets being shot, the tear gas being, being thrown at the student residences? And now, when I also reflect on this is that I was supposed to come to the university to do a course for five years. I ended up doing uh, seven years of the of the course because I had to take a break in between because of the leadership or poor leadership that came from uh, university management. And now I'm taking all that. And it pains me sometimes to say that now, okay, fine, Sapang, you finished your course now. You have you are under you are doing your LLM. And now uh, uh, Anita, my, re my reflection also comes to say that now, even after the violence, these universities did not intensify as they would have when there were violence with police and uh, 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 and the private security. They did not increase the stuff, the personnel at uh, student counseling and development. And to this day, we still are saying as student and uh, as student leaders, because I've started an organization called Next Chapter, where I, I speak and destigmatize mental health conversation, because I do believe that now the universities are not doing anything about it. To them, they were saying, I was doing my duties. I needed to protect the institution. I needed to protect the image of the institution. But they forgot that now, at the end of the day, we are people, not stones. They forgot that the essence of what we were fighting for is that now we please be reminded that we are people, not stones. So yes, Anita, there are quite a lot of things that we can reflect on. We've lost comrades. Some lost comrades lost their lives. Some comrades could not come back to their academics. Some comrades to this day are in one of the pictures that Bogan uses that we're still using alcohol trying to escape because we cannot account to our trauma. Thank you. Mm. Uh, uh, may I quickly come in? Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Tsepang. And, and also, of course, thank you very much for Tsepang to be here. And, um, and so uh, we always try to make sure that um, the original student participants uh, are, are part of um, such uh, engagements. So, for example, also at the University of Stellenbosch, we had Asandiswa Bombana, um, who was uh, uh, participating throughout. But uh, it's a good reminder, actually, uh, Anita, that we should just systematically try and invite all the student leaders. I mean, we, 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 we communicated with some of them, mostly from the University of the Free State, for this particular seminar only. Um, but I believe uh, Kamuhelo is also part of the, is also a participant. Maybe she wants to say a few words as well. All right, uh, please go ahead, Kamu, if you're here and you would like to say something. OK, maybe while we wait for Kamu to, to think about what she would like to reflect on, there is. Um, Sorry, it, it is Bukhan. It's, it's, it's not it's not Kamu Hello, it's Bukhan. Ah, OK, perfect. Uh, please go ahead, Bukhan. Uh, greetings to everyone. Do I need to turn my camera on? Uh, if you can, if you can't, please go ahead without it. Okay, okay, I'll just proceed without it. Um, obviously, I was not prepared to talk, but I do have, you know, a few submissions I would like to make. Um, first of all, thank you for this, you know, brilliant research. I think my favorite thing about this this project, this research, is how it's so intentional in trying to capture the personal experiences and trying to you know inform us about the personal the personal and practical experiences during the during the FISMAS 4 um, protest i submitted two pictures that Tsepang spoke about the one of the just acad academic record and the one of tomary and you know one of the reasons i submitted those particular pictures was because of how much of a reality that is for many students who are involved in protests who are student leaders. Because um, 
protests happened in 2015, 16, 17, they, could, they still continue to happen, but there are students who suffer the systematic violence from the university by just merely trying you know, to advocate for themselves and to fight for themselves. And uh, today it's 2021, but we still meet students who we were at the front lines with, who are now suspended by the universities, who are now unemployed, who are now you know, alcoholics and because of what the university has done to them. And I think if we, we engage on this project of trying to trying to capture these personal experiences and teach people about them. I'm currently writing my main thesis on criminalization of the right to protest. And my focus is particularly on how one of the chapters in my in my thesis is how the university, the government and the state have responded to this protest. And the way in which they they respond, it's obviously one violent, but they're also actively criminalizing the right to protest because they either make sure that students are suspended, they either make sure that students end up in jail, they either make sure that students do not even gather at, at, at university premises. And this speaks a lot to how um, the university space in itself does not entertain the idea of, of cultivating true leaders. They just want to protect themselves. They do not want anyone who will not challenge the status quo because they just want to protect themselves. They want to protect uh, their history, especially universities that were, you know, previously white universities where black students are dominating. So, but yeah, that is all I have to say. Thank you very much for this research and the opportunity to speak. Um, thank you very much, Wakang. Uh, we are five minutes to time, and I think at this point I will also take advantage of my uh, position as chair and then ask a few questions. I guess the, the first question is um, based on what Angelina said, and I think it came out throughout the presentation that uh, this kind of violence that we witness is not really the intention of the protest. Uh, but it is a reaction. It is some kind of um, response. There are certain triggers that and uh, that lead up to violence. I do know that there may be a, a number of triggers, but I would like to hear from the presenters. What do you think is that number one trigger that tops them all? And then um, the second question that I would like to ask is uh, a methodological question. What do you think were the what kind of challenges did you experience when you were doing the rapid photo voice? Because obviously, like you say, it's not something that is common. It's not something that some of us who have used photo voice uh, ha have used. So what are the, the challenges that one should look out for if they do decide to go this uh, route? Uh, I would stop there because I see that there is a hand. But before I take the hand, I able to respond to those questions. Thank you. I'll respond to the to the triggers. Uh, Terry stated that universities are bureaucratic, so therefore the, there are processes that uh, students need to to follow with regard to to lodging their their complaints. Then students would write, have meetings with their relevant officers and their authorities. At times, depending on you know the university, the university would normally students are expected to write, but the response that they would get would be a response that is verbal. I mean, when there's some, something like that, there's particularly there's basically no commitment from the part of the of the university. Because what I say, I can just change it next week and say, say something else. Or the university would agree with the students that, okay, and these are timelines, fine. However, there's no follow through. They don't do what they're supposed to do or as they expected, as they agreed. And students would be, you know, persistent, persistent, persistent and, and, and agree. Uh, I can make one example. Uh, at the University of Venda, it was during our research, it was stated that there was an issue with the release of the NFSAS funds. OK, university agrees, yes, we have this problem. NFSAS says, no, 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 it's your university. Your university is not doing this. So you see now when there, where there is no actual stance as what is actually going on, when students are actually not told the truth, it becomes 
it, it destroys the little trust that there is in the structures. And when there's no trust, conflict is likely to happen. And such a such conflict also allows for, for violence because when the management realizes that now the students are fed up, how do they pre prevent? They call the intervention of the police security. So that is the main thing, the lack of trust and honesty. Thank you. Uh, may I add something quickly to that? Um, I, I think, you know, uh, Kiamu has actually written an, a PhD on the culture of violence on university campuses. And um, uh, I think she will probably be able to correct me, but part of it is on the one hand that, um, in fact, so many students come from very violent communities where protests as well are, are a relatively common occurrence. Uh, we know that South Africa is the protest capital of the world and service delivery protests or whatever, uh, whatever other kinds of euphemisms we have to describe it are just too commonplace. I mean, we've just come out of a horrendous week of violence in, 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 in July, right? And so what, what are the triggers? You know, sometimes uh, uh, the, a, a trigger can be as obvious as what happened at Chimla Park, you know, um, uh, where, where, you know, after the Shimla Park event, one had almost a week of violence and where even the picture of Tsepang and the, the Dean of Students, um, they're trying to hug him, you know, where, where, which is part of that week of violence and counter violence that, that uh, occurred. So sometimes it's a very obvious kind of, kind of trigger. Sometimes it is actually just that when things uh, reach the point of protesting, then the culture of protesting has actually already, is already a violent culture. And, and, and there's a spiral there and the student, student protest uh, theories, theories of student activism and so on show very clearly that we, whenever there is a violent response to student violence, it escalates more and it just exacerbates such a culture. And we really need to, at some point, one needs to ask, how are we going to stop this? And we're not going to stop it with more violence. We need to just change the way we are engaging. And we need to change the way the systems operate and the, st and, and, and the structures uh, operate, the institutionalized structures of engaging and negotiating and decision making. I think that that is uh, 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 where eventually we need to get at. Um, uh, the second question, maybe Cirelezzo can respond to that, your question about the method. Um, I see that we are past our uh, designated time. I would really like to apologize to everybody who's joining us. Uh, maybe what I can do right now is to officially end the webinar and then ask uh, people that are interested in further discussions to remain with us and then we can continue with the discussions. Does that sound okay with you, Thierry and Tim? Yes, it's, it's okay with me. I, however, I have to say that Angelina has had to leave because she's attending another meeting, but I'm here. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So I guess then we have to end the session here. It's really been a lively discussion and uh, thank you so much for the work that you're doing uh, and uh, thank you for representing the students and putting their voices out there. It high, again, for me, in terms of photo voice, it really highlights the power of, of pictures. Thank you to our two discussants, Ntimi and Carmen, and thank you to colleagues that joined us for this webinar. You, we really hope that uh, you gained something from it. These are the kinds of conversations that are ongoing in our department, and we hope that you're going to be able to join us for the next webinar that's scheduled for the 20th of September. Thank you again. Um, today we end here and until the next webinar, it's goodbye from our research group. Sure. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you. Bye. Okay. So oh, I guess. Um, nice to see you. Welcome <laughs> back right. to Free State. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Daba. Hello, Faith. <laughs>
Hello, hello. <laughs> so I guess everybody wants to leave can leave. Then uh, some of us who still have uh, questions yeah. can remain behind been, and have mm, a discussion. I've, yeah. I've been following the bang on LinkedIn and Facebook. And there's some great work. Theory is that um, you will have to find a way in which we need to um, bring this work to Mandela University as well, man. By all means, we will definitely do that. Uh. Okay, so I, I noticed that Mika Teko had a ray. Uh, she's still here. She hasn't left. Uh, she had a, her hand raised. May I give you a chance, Mika, to ask your question? Yes, thank you and congratulations um, on, on the team on a great presentation as, as people have said before. Um, the question that I had um, in mind was uh, due to the due to noticing that Biko came up um, several times during the presentation, both under the safe spaces discussion and then also later on uh, in discussing well-being. So I was wondering what um, the deliberations on his work of their consciousness reveal about what it means to be a black youth in higher education uh, today, because of course, much of the challenges that were being faced then continue, but they're also new and very different uh, challenges that are being faced by black youth. So I wondered what the, the student participants had to say about um, whether or not those deliberations speak to and inform their understanding about what it means to be a black youth in higher education today. And then the other question I had was whether or not participating in this photo voice process um, had kind of influenced how they think about how young people should be doing advocacy work going forward. And then kind of linked to that um, is whether or not they'd learned anything both from the process and from being student activists, um, what their message or kind of key advice might be to future student leaders. Um, so yeah, those are the questions I, I had in mind. Thank you. Thanks, Mika. We'll leave uh, uh, Kiamu and Thierry to respond to that. I will first respond to your, your question about the challenges of photo voice. Okay, okay sure. Yes, yes please. Go uh, ahead. Yeah. Um, hmm. The main challenge was implementing photo voice, particularly with ours, since it was for three three days instead of, you know, we went up against the norm, which was months. So that was the first main challenge. We were wondering, mm, would it really, actually, would it work? All of those questions. And when we were seeking for permission at some campuses, it was not, they were not, not, not receptive to, to the uh, our ethical processes in that we required uh, the student activists to actually, you know, sign and commit. Uh, that yes, I agree to my photos being used and my name. So, so, so those were the main uh, institutional challenges that we we encountered. However, making the process a bit easier for us was that we were very transparent with regard to what we're doing, how we are going to do it, and uh, the the outcome uh, in relation to the work that we're doing with the with the student activists. For instance, one of our ethical principles was that uh, there are possibilities for self-incrimination. So we made sure that student activists, whatever it is that they would say that we realize that <coughs> is not on, we stopped them. Uh, please reflect on this. Do you want this to be on record or, or not? And secondly, what we did, we gave them an opportunity to always, they, they know that if they believe that whatever photo that they have, have given to us is not proper, they want to, it to be uh, retracted or anonymized, or even the, the information on the transcript, they had the, the, the leeway to do that. So, to circumvent those challenges, that is what we did, and we were so we also shared our, our, our personal experiences, so that there's an element of of rapport. And as you know, even today we still have some of the of the of the of the activists in the in the in the webinar. So 
the challenges is is basically to to keep on being truthful being vulnerable as a researcher not not hiding that uh, I, I know this even if it's uncomfortable be open so that the activists or whoever you'd be working with would would see that you know you are genuine because without genuineness the process becomes a bit faltered and a bit muddy yes so thank you um hello can i also add to um in terms of some of the difficulties we encountered with the photo voice or the rapid photo voice i joined um the project during its late stages um yeah at the time when i joined they were only doing the the vir virtual photo voice sessions at dut and it was through that that i got to experience um the photo voice experience uh with the student activists so i think because they were virtual they were conducted over zoom and as you can imagine one of the main problems was connection problems um which kind of you know um made the, the experience to be a little bit disjointed or fractured sometimes people did not pitch some some participants did not pitch although they did later submit their photos um and captions via whatsapp but they did not pitch so i think it's something that it's more likely that they would have been there if you know they had committed to a time previously and not only just the time to do the photo voice because they they might feel like okay i have the phone i can do it from anywhere but then if it's like there's a time and a place then they kind of have to physically be there so i think in that way we might have seen more participants um participating uh during the actual photo voice session as opposed to them later submitting their pictures and captions um, another thing was there were instances of participants doing other things, like you could tell they're doing other things while the photo voice was going on, you know, and also the sharing of photos and captions. Although we did get um, a lot of, uh, the data was meaningful, but it was quite impersonal, you know, uh, so, so yeah, that does affect it, but not in a significant way. It's just that um, you can't be there with them next to them, you know, like, okay, so like, what's the caption that we would give to this, what's the name, and then you're just talking it out as two people. So that experience for me personally, I felt it was a bit impersonal, but we did get um, very meaningful data from that regardless. And I think the last uh, point I would give with regards to the virtual photo voice sessions was that um, the data issue, which obviously we provided to them, but the other thing was accessibility to technological devices. So not everyone had a laptop, you know, um, and also with regards to smartphones, there were glitches uh, with logging in and then maybe it's logging out during the session. So, yeah, I think those are the main uh, difficulties that we encountered uh, mm -hmm. during our mm -hmm. virtual photo break session. Yes. Thank you. All right, um, thank you. I think uh, so that we don't stay too long um, over time. Maybe if uh, we can get a response to Mika's uh, question and then we can call it a day. Does anyone want to respond to Mika's question? The, the parts that I'll respond to are the, the changes, not the because writing, because it is the student activists who, who are better placed to answer that. Uh, first of all, what, what was um, encouraging about uh, the project is that we, we, after doing it, we actually did an evaluation of the project and the the student activists shared that this was an enriching uh, project in that it allowed them to to reflect on uh, on their actions, but also it it gave them a, a safe space to to vent out all those pent up emotions that and and experiences that they never spoken about. I mean. Um, uh, as Terry said, I, I did uh, I did my research on, on cultural violence and I realized that uh, students were actually not using the uh, 
student counseling services. And their, their responses were was that they don't actually trust uh, the, the student counseling services. And when the, the, they don't trust that and they still have these challenges that they are facing, it means that the cycle goes on and there's no you know, safe space. So the project for them created that element of a safe space. And most importantly, what was also shown was how during protests, students tend to forget the students with disability and also the management. Everybody forgets about them. That they will throw um, tear gas in a residence that, that is designated for students with disability. These are people who are not sighted. They use wheelchairs or whatever. So it made, you know, our students to to, to think about other other areas and and other ways of of of, of you know mm -hmm. approaching their their issues, particularly with the university management. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that response. I think uh, so that you can um, let people uh, continue doing the other work that they have scheduled for the day. We will stop here. Uh, may I kindly ask you to turn on your cameras so that we take a picture uh, that we can uh, maybe post on our website uh, talking about the webinar. Is it OK? If you feel comfortable, please do um, switch on your camera, then we can take a picture. OK, great. Um, I only see one, two, three. OK, uh, let me see how many people I can capture.